Good afternoon to all of you. Good afternoon to faculty, to staff, to our esteemed Board of Trustees members, to our uh, recent graduates, to our current students, and most especially to our incoming first year and transfer students. To begin our seminar, we have with us a very special guest, our own president, Dr. Donald Eastman. As most of you will know, Dr. Eastman is concluding 19 years as president of Eckerd College, and he will become president emeritus on July the 1st. Under his leadership, our institution has survived hardship and has flourished. He has made Eckerd College an institution that is what we all want to be, resilient in the face of adversity. And he has made us a forward-thinking and innovative change leader in the world of higher education. What you may not know, however, is that Dr. Eastman's undergraduate major was philosophy, and his PhD is in English literature. His insistence on a contemplative and ethical approach to the challenges that face us is evident in his numerous published essays and in his op-eds on literature and higher education. He has also published poetry, and one of his poems, titled Update on Thebes, published in 2014, depicts Tampa Bay as the inheritor of a plague that once, ra once ravaged Thebes in Sophocles' Oedipus the King. Both plagues, he says, are caused by blindness. So in this time of both blindness and hope, it gives me great pleasure to introduce President Eastman, who will offer some brief remarks to inaugurate our series, Pandemic and Our Changing World. President Eastman. Thank you, Heather, and good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Eckerd College Seminar, Pandemic and Our Changing World. I'm delighted to welcome you to this eight-week exploration of this most timely of topics led by 11 of Eckerd College's extraordinary faculty. There is no better subject for a seminar which illustrates the multiple approaches to knowledge than pandemics. And you will see that in this seminar as the subject is examined from the perspective of the disciplines of the sciences, the social sciences, and the humanities. I would characterize pandemics with three brief elements. First, it may come as a surprise to some of you that pandemics are frequent events in human history and major factors in altering that history. The earliest recorded pandemic happened in 430 BC during the Peloponnesian War and killed two thirds of the population of Athens, contributing mightily to their defeat by the Spartans. Second, pandemics hold up a mirror to both individuals and their societies, throwing in high relief the structural weaknesses of the societies they ravage. This feature is dramatically visible in the way COVID-19 is affecting our society. Thirdly, pandemics spur societies to re-examine philosophical, religious, and moral issues with a new purpose and a new intensity. The bubonic plague, also known as the Black Death, which was responsible for a third of the world, of the death of the world, a third of the world's population between the early 14th century and the middle of the 17th century, radically reshaped ideas about man's relationship to God and to other men. We read it in sermons and treaties, and we see its effect in the revolution in European art. So frequent, revealing, existential. Let's see if this seminar bears me out. Every epidemic has public health issue lessons for society, some of which are learned and some of which are not, at least until the recurrence of several versions of the epidemic. One thinks, for example, of Napoleon's arrogant response to yellow fever. 
which dashed his hopes for controlling the new world and led to his sale of the what's now called the Louisiana Purchase. And the early political responses in Africa to Ebola, which made the disease a continental epidemic. But there are an array of other lessons to be learned because pandemics are not just about germs, but about how we respond to them. So what are the lessons we should learn from our pandemic, scientific, economic, political, moral, religious? The answers to these questions now have an emphatic urgency because they are not only about survival, but about how we are to live and to what purpose during and after this year of COVID-19. I can't wait to learn what the brilliant minds of a great college have to teach us and help us learn together. Welcome again to each of you to the seminar. Thank you so much, President Eastman. We are really honored that you are speaking with us today and that you have joined, joined us for the first in our series. Our, our plenary speaker for today, for our topic, the psychological and, Im and, and emotional impact of the pandemic, is Dr. Sarah Hoffman, Assistant Professor of Psychology at Eckerd College. Dr. Hoffman earned her Bachelor of Science in Psychology from Florida State University, her MA in Clinical Psychology from Clark University, and her PhD in Counseling Psychology from the University of Northern Colorado. She has been awarded grants from the Merle and Marion Graham Fund for her research involving clin clinical intervention techniques for at-risk and court-involved adolescents. In particular, she studies the effect of mindfulness and similar strategies on these populations. Currently, Dr. Hoffman is partnered with Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital, where she co-leads a project designed to better address the mental health needs of adolescents. So let us welcome Dr. Sarah Hoffman. Thank you, that's Vincent. I'm so excited to be here with all of you today. Uh, I, I'm really excited to see where we go with this series as a learning community. Um, and I'm excited to uh, share with you some information about one per, uh, psychological lens that we can use uh, when dealing with this most unusual of current events. Um, as uh, Professor Vincent said, I'm an assistant professor in the psychology department. Um, I typically study children and adolescents. Uh, so I look at trauma and the ways in which we can uh, uh, work on effects of trauma and allow individuals to move forward uh, with positive growth and change despite earlier adversity. Um, I am a social scientist, um, and so as a social scientist, a lot of the way in which I uh, study the world involves data and numbers. I'm a quantitative social scientist. Um, so I brought some of that perspective uh, to work with you all today. So I brought some uh, data that my, my lab and I have collected fairly recently um, about this pandemic to share with you. Um, I'm also a licensed psychologist, and so I, I carry a client load, and I've uh, been working with individuals throughout this pandemic um, to help manage some of their more negative emotions and stress. Um, so I, I feel like I've gotten a fairly unusual perspective on this pandemic, um, being that I've been working with students, I've been collecting data from a, a scientific point of view, um, and I'm also hearing daily on the ground stories from frontline workers across the country um, as part of my uh, work inside the profession. So I'm really excited to share some of this information with you. Um, and let's jump in and get started. Um, I've used a PowerPoint to organize my presentation today. It's been posted on Moodle, um, so it's available for your reference. It also has a, a further reading page at the end of it, so in case you'd like more information about any of the topics we cover today, there's some recommended resources for you to use as well. Let me go ahead and get my screen sharing here. All right, so we're going to talk today, as I said, about the psychological and emotional impacts, but I want to give you an idea of what we're going to be doing. Um, so first, we're going to talk about the psychological factors that are related to the current pandemic experience. And as a scientist, I really split these into two pieces. One is helping to identify what exactly the stressors are that people are facing, and second, information about how we're reacting psychologically to those stressors that are part of the pandemic. 
In the second section, we'll talk about some psychological factors that are related to long-term effects of the pandemic. As much as we all wish this had an end date, we're not really sure what's going to happen. And this is likely going to be a, 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 a it's going to unfold over several years, let's put it that way. So we're look, we'll look also at some factors that are affecting long-term effects. And then we're going to finish out by talking about post-traumatic growth, which is the idea that adversity can create positive change. So we'll talk through that idea and also offer some ideas from the research literature about ways in which um, anyone can uh, foster their own growth even while facing a challenge such as a pandemic. At the end of our time together, we'll have some time for Q&A. So if you're having thoughts or questions come up, please make a note of them and we'll have time for that at the end of the presentation. Okay, so let's start with stressors. Let's just be very honest. A pandemic is a very stressful time to be a human being. There's just a lot happening in so many different ways. Individuals are trying to navigate personal relationships, occupations, st studies for college students. Um, we're just trying to navigate being a normal person that can go to the grocery store is now highly, highly, highly stressful for most people. So keep in mind that that's the lens that we're using from a psychological perspective is that this is just generally a stressful time to be a human being. And as researchers, we really wanna know more about that. We wanna know what stressors we're facing and how exactly are we, are we reacting to those things. As Professor Vincent said in my uh, introduction, I typically study children and adolescents, but my specialty is trauma. So my, what, I, what I mostly see in my own small practice is individuals who have experienced trauma and are trying to figure out how to move past that and how to move forward in their lives. So even though I don't typically work with a lot of adults, I know a lot about trauma. And this is a really uh, traumatic time for a lot of people. So being a researcher, my immediate reaction was, I want to get some data on this. I want to understand what's happening within the lens of, of my own lens as a trauma specialist. I want to understand what people are facing so that we can best understand how to help them. So I'm going to start there with some of the data that my lab and I collected. So we asked about both of these areas in April 2020, so approximately a month ago, we got 878 adults um, in the U.S. to answer questions for us. So we have a pretty big sample of individuals, and we asked them to self-report um, on some specific stressors that they're experiencing, as well as how they're reacting to them. I also do want to point out this was a non-clinical sample. So in psychology terms, that means these are not individuals who already have a diagnosis of some kind. Um, these are just individuals that are sort of off the street, typical people. We're not looking for them specifically in a treatment setting. These are just individuals. Um, some of them may have had a diagnosis, but that wasn't one of our qualifications. So that's called a non-clinical sample. This becomes important as we're talking through our results that these are not individuals that already have a diagnosis. So I wanna start by showing you uh, some of our results that we got about specific stressors. So we created a bank of stressors and asked participants to mark which ones they were having trouble with and if they were having problems in those areas to mark how severe those, those issues were. And so I decided to present this information to you today by making a chart of the percentage of individuals who were reporting that they were having significant distress in each area. And here's what we found. So, the highest area that people reported having significant problems was in employment. So 55.6% of our sample said that they were having trouble in employment either because they had already lost their job due to COVID factors or they were in imminent danger of losing their job because of COVID factors. So we have over half of our sample that's concerned about their employment. We also had a very large portion, 38.6%, that's worried about maintaining or accessing safe housing. This is likely related to uh, economic instability from employment concerns, but this also included uh, individuals who in the comment section wrote that they lived with someone who had tested positive for COVID and they were no longer comfortable in their housing, but they felt like they didn't have anywhere to go. So individuals were very concerned about their housing. Another area in which they were extremely concerned was close relationships. As all of you have probably experienced, living together in quarantine, even with people that you love very much, is a tough ask. So um, people are uh, reflecting a lot of problems in close relationships, in parenting, in any kind of intimate relationship. Individuals are reporting a lot of stress in those areas. I do wanna point out that there is an area that I, I really expected to be higher at this point, which is the third one down, confirmed COVID in a loved one, 
only 29% of individuals were concerned about that. So it's still a, a large chunk of people, but there were a lot more people concerned about employment than about um, the COVID-19 virus actually affecting someone they knew that they loved. Again, this data was collected in April, and I would suspect this would be different had we collected this data today. Um, but at the time that we collected it, individuals were very concerned about economics, uh, and they were very concerned about intimate relationships. So as researchers, that gives us an idea about where we should target our, um, our interventions to make sure that we're addressing uh, issues that are important to people. So that helps me understand the first part of this question. What are the stressors? The second part of the question has to deal with stress reactions. So yes, these are the things that are stressing us, but how are we dealing with those things? So my lab and I decided to look at this through the lens of anxiety. Anxiety is the most common stress reaction. So individuals under stress will most commonly manifest anxiety. And anxiety is a, a set of thoughts and a set of uh, perceptions in your body um, that help you understand that you're feeling very, very worried. So this might be repetitive thoughts. I don't know what's going to happen. I'm worried about X, Y, or Z. This might also be symptoms in your body. So it might be muscle tension or restlessness, um, increased heart rate, increased breathing, headaches. There's lots of ways that anxiety might reflect. So we decided because this is the most common reflection, or the most common reaction, to look at anxiety in our study. So some level of anxiety is really normal and is adaptive for survival. Everyone needs anxiety in some way or else we'd be fearless and we'd get hurt all the time because we would just jump off a bridge and do whatever we think we could. So some level of anxiety is normal and adaptive. It lets us know that there is something happening here that's potentially dangerous or harmful and maybe we should think twice about this, get ourselves out of this situation, etc. It helps motivate us to stay safe. So some level of anxiety is really adaptive, but you hit a level of anxiety that's almost paralyzing for individuals. And in order to understand a little bit more about where anxiety comes from, let's talk a bit about when anxiety occurs. So there's really several different situations that are triggers for anxiety. The first one in which we typically experience anxiety is when we believe that we or our loved ones are in danger. So if we feel like we're about to be harmed or there's potential for someone we love to be harmed, we tend to be very anxious about that possibility. Again, this is a safety mechanism. So if our safety is being threatened, we feel very anxious. That feeling cues us that we need to change something. So if we believe that we're in danger or a loved one's in danger, that will create anxiety. If events feel outside of our control, again, this is a safety mechanism. So if we're controlling our environment, we know what's going to happen, we feel safe. If, if events are outside of our control, we no longer feel safe because our environment's unpredictable. So that will create anxiety. We often are anxious also when we feel like we can't predict the outcome of events. So we're not really sure how this event's going to go. I know it's happening right now. I don't know how this is going to end. And because I don't know how it's going to end, I can no longer prepare for this outcome. So again, as a safety mechanism, if I can't prepare for this to try to take steps to keep myself safe, this makes me very, very anxious. And then a fourth way that we are often triggered to feel anxious is if others in our environment are modeling anxiety. So even if I'm not nervous about something, if I see a loved one or a neighbor or a classmate or a you know, coworker, if I see other people being anxious, I think, well, maybe I should be anxious too. <laughs> so. Um, if we see others modeling anxiety, that tends to make us anxious as well. Even if we're not sure exactly why we should be nervous, it looks like maybe that's, a, that's the way to go because we're seeing other people do that. I will add that in the modern world, we're constantly getting this social feedback as we have for millennia, but we also are getting it from people that we actually don't know at this point. So these are not individuals that we actually know necessarily that are you know, people that we share a home with or in our neighborhoods, um, but we're getting constant feedback on this from individuals via social media, um, via television shows and other types of media. We're getting constant social feedback that we should be nervous. And we are hardwired to follow that recommendation from other individuals. Because if they're nervous, I should probably be nervous. And your brain will just sort of take that as the, the recommendation. Well, if they're nervous, there's probably a reason. In the modern world, though, we are constantly bombarded with all of these messages. And we're not really sure if this is a person whose opinion we should trust or whose opinion we would agree with, but we're constantly getting these messages regardless. And we're wired for safety concerns um, to follow if other people in our environment are modeling anxiety. So I want you to take a, a second with me here and really think about your experience in the pandemic versus all four of these potential triggers for anxiety. It is likely 
that at some point you thought that you or a loved one are probably in danger of contracting the virus or some other type of negative um, outcome from the pandemic. It's likely that you're feeling like many of the events lately are out of control. It's likely that you're feeling that we can't effectively prepare for the outcome because nobody really knows what the outcome is going to be. And it's likely that you have multiple, multiple others in your environment that are modeling anxiety. So generally, this is the pandemic. So the pandemic is generally hitting every anxiety trigger that humans are wired for in order to make us nervous. The pandemic is setting off alarms on every single front. So it's not at all surprising that most individuals are feeling a lot of anxiety at this point in time. So we understand where the anxiety comes from. As a researcher, what I wanna know is, this theoretically makes sense, but do I actually have data points to back this up? And what does this actually look like? So in the second part of our study, or the second part of our survey, um, we uh, created an anxiety screener. And so the anxiety screener that we used is called a GAD-7. Um, it's a general anxiety disorder. It's seven items. And so it's a screener that's um, very commonly used um, uh, in medical settings. And it asks individuals some questions that are typical uh, characteristics of anxiety disorders. So it asks individuals, have you experienced any of these things? Um, and it, um, so that it allows uh, doctors and medical staff to flag anyone that might be struggling with anxiety and should be referred to a behavioral health specialist. So what it asks is, how often have you been bothered by the following in the past two weeks? So at the time that we collected this data in April 2020, the past two weeks had been very much pandemic related. Um, so this had been all pandemic all the time on the news stations and most of the information individuals had gotten. So some of the um, issues that it asks about are something like feeling nervous or anxious or feeling on edge feeling afraid as if something awful might happen, becoming easily annoyed or irritable. Some of you might be thinking, yes, yes, and yes. These are all things that I'm experiencing. So these are the sample prompts. Um, so there's seven questions like this and we ask individuals to respond to them of, you know, how much have they been feeling like this over the past two weeks? In a typical uh, administration of a GAD-7, you have about 10 to 20 percent of the sample will fall in the moderate or severe anxiety range based on their answers. And individuals in those ranges would be referred to mental health. So they'd be referred to see a licensed mental health provider to be assessed or to start therapy based on their level of anxiety. So again, keep this in mind, about 10 to 20 percent in a typical sample. We took a sample at towards the beginning of the pandemic in April 2020, and this is what we got. So in our study, a score range of zero to four, which is little anxiety, was literally 0% of our sample. So out of 878 adults, there was not a single person who was reporting that they just felt a little bit or no, or no anxiety at all. Not a single person. In the next category for mild anxiety, we had 23.5% of our sample. So they're reporting some symptoms, but could monitor those at home and wouldn't necessarily require professional help to work on those symptoms. We then had about 27.6% in the moderate anxiety category, in which it's recommended that individuals seek assessment with a mental health provider. So it's not necessarily saying start therapy right now, but you do wanna go speak to someone about your symptoms and be checked out by a professional. And then in the severe anxiety category, we had 49.4% of our sample. So almost half of our sample would be directly referred to a mental health professional to start therapy because of the intensity of their symptoms. So in a typical sample, the combination of moderate and severe anxiety respondents is typically between 10 and 20%. And in our sample that we collected, if we add these two together, we're looking at almost 80% of our sample that fell in that range. So our research question was, are people actually anxious at a higher rate than they normally would be? And the answer is absolutely. Um, so in our sample, people were highly, highly, highly anxious. And it's, I believe it's, it's a reflective sample um, of, of what most adults in the country are, are experiencing right now. And as you all read um, in, in one of your assigned articles, the mental health system is already fairly overburdened. Um, and now we're looking at these rates of anxiety, also depression, social isolation, suicidal thoughts, all these other things that are coming, uh, coming along with that. Um, 
and that is um, it, that is currently overloading the mental health system. It makes absolute sense why everyone feels so anxious, and we have lots of data to show how everybody's anxious. And we're going to talk uh, later in the presentation about what we're doing as a field to work on those things. But this helps us understand about 80% of our sample was highly anxious versus about 10 to 20% of a typical sample. We are looking at a massive, massive, massive group of people that's going to need assistance. So the anxiety is definitely overwhelming. However, there's also some other pieces of the, um, of the pandemic that are creating stress reactions. And one of them is moral fatigue. So moral fatigue is the idea that if you have to make decisions that feel very ethically high stakes, that those are really uh, exhausting decisions to make. You have to really think through all of the ramifications of each of your choices. You have to make choices that there's not really a clear answer. These are very, very cognitively tiring for individuals. And moral, uh, moral and ethical decisions tend to be a fairly small part of individual's day in a more typical situation. But in a pandemic, things that were formerly routine have now become moral, ethical, high stakes decisions. So if we think about something that was a, a mundane routine aspect, like going to the grocery store, remember when going to the grocery store used to not be a big deal? <laughs> it used to just be, I'm going, you know, to stop on the way home and pick up milk. It'll take me five minutes. I go in and out. And now when you're going to the grocery store, there's a whole cascade of ethical and emotional considerations. It's, am I going to be exposed to a potentially lethal disease while I'm at the store getting food? What if I don't go? What will we eat? If I ask for it to be delivered, am I exposing the delivery person to that potential? Am I ethically okay with that, that I have put someone else up in front of me to, to protect me? If I go to the store and I somehow contract something and I don't get ill, but I bring it back home and someone in my home or a loved one gets ill, am I willing to take that risk? All of these considerations have become part of seemingly routine um, errands that we used to do without thinking about it. And having your entire day filled with those types of decisions is incredibly exhausting. So individuals are reporting anxiety related to those decisions, but also just general fatigue. Um, just generally having a hard time thinking, um, processing, attention, concentration, those pieces. And then we also are experiencing a lot of grief and loss in multiple areas and in different ways. So I invite you to think just for a few minutes while we're talking about this, think with me about some of the losses that you might have experienced in the past few months. For most people, this starts with the idea of a loss of a sense of normalcy. So things that we just used to do and not think about it at all, all of our sort of normal routines have been completely upended. You might have gone to a yoga class, you know, stopped by to have dinner with friends, um, anything that you were sort of normally doing likely disappeared. So there's this sense of normalcy that we've completely lost and are now grieving. You might have lost an individual or more than one that you knew to this virus. Um, you know, our graduates, unfortunately, were not able to celebrate with us in person. That was a major loss for our community and for also for those uh, graduating seniors. There are lots of places in which people are grieving losses that they've endured because of this pandemic. It doesn't mean that they're not grateful for other pieces of life, but there are definitely, there's grief and there's loss happening in multiple areas and in different ways that individuals are contending with. And as humans, a lot of the way that we deal with grief is through a grief process. And so we have uh, sort of rituals and we have ceremonies that we have developed as, as a human community to help us mark these major milestones and move past uh, events that are, are harmful or are um, unpleasant. So, and those are not being permitted to happen right now. So individuals who were looking forward to celebrating a marriage um, with their friends and family are no longer able to do that. You can have a Zoom wedding, but for many people that's still, that's not what they envisioned for their wedding day. And so they're losing that dream that they had of what that would look like. For individuals who are dealing with grief after the loss of a loved one, they are not being permitted to have a funeral or a wake to gather the social support that they typically would um, in those situations. And that is also impacting individuals' ability to manage stress and to, to manage the complete upending of life that's happened here. Our social support that we use uh, in order to manage stress for a lot of people has also been completely dismantled. Um, so most individuals are, are not gathering together in large groups or small groups for that matter. Um, we're using you know, digital technology solutions to get social support, but for a lot of individuals um, that isn't working or they really don't have anyone to speak with. 
um, for individuals who are socially isolated, um, their interaction with their Starbucks barista might be the only person they talk to all day. And now that person is not there and they're not permitted to have that interaction. So social support is changing. Rituals and ceremonies are not happening. Um, individuals are really struggling with a lot of changes and a lot of really negative experiences. So if we think about those in combination, there's the stress and anxiety that's happening because the pandemic situation is pushing all of our anxiety buttons. There's the moral fatigue of making all of these um, decisions that feel very life and death. There's grief and loss processes. And inside that grief and loss, we're not able to participate in the rituals and the ceremonies and the social support that often help us move past this. When we think about those cumulative, uh, this qualifies as trauma for many people. And as a, as a trauma specialist, this, this idea to me was really interesting to think about the ways in which trauma might be affecting people. What do we know from the trauma literature that we can pull from that experience and give to individuals now as part of the pandemic? If we think about it from the trauma lens, then we already know a lot about this. So yes, the pandemic is an entirely unique perspective. And in a lot of ways, this is all stuff we've never seen before. But for psychologists, we know a lot about trauma. And if we think about what's happening, what people are facing now, what their stressors are and how they're dealing with those stressors, if we think about it through the lens of trauma, we actually already know a lot about this and we have a lot of tools. So let's uh, talk a little bit about trauma. Trauma is a distressing event that overwhelms an individual's internal coping resources. So if we think about the pandemic as a sort of single, ongoing, very slow moving event, it's often overwhelming internal coping resources. So a lot of individuals, what they're experiencing could absolutely be qualified as trauma. Whether or not it's traumatic will depend on the individual. Um, trauma, the development of trauma symptoms is very different from person to person. You can have 300 people on the same airplane that crashes and you will have a very wide variety of reactions afterwards. So not everyone necessarily would see this as traumatic. It will depend on a lot of factors, but it absolutely could be qualified as trauma for individuals. But a piece that I want you all to, to start to unpack on Thursday in your discussion section is that this also might be an example of collective trauma. And collective trauma is an event or a series of events that shatters the experience of safety for a group or for groups of people. So this is a particular event or a series of them that makes a group of people realize or, or feel that they are not safe in some way. And so some examples in the literature of collective trauma include Hurricane Katrina, September 11th, the Pulse nightclub shooting, and I think you can make the argument that this pandemic experience might be another example of a collective trauma in some ways. And I'm hoping that in your discussion section on Thursdays, you all will use this framework to think about the ways in which this pandemic experience may be collective and ways in which it may not be collective. And I know that some of the other, uh, my colleagues in the plenary will also explore these from their own uh, discipline lenses about ways in which things are collective and not. So I'd like for you all on Thursday to start thinking about this idea and start thinking about this framework. It's one that we'll continue to use throughout our conversations together this semester. So that's some of the things that are happening right now. But as psychologists, we're also planning on uh, working for or working with and supporting things that will be unfolding for years to come on long-term effects. So in order to start thinking about that, I wanted to share this graphic with you. It's from SAMHSA, so it's from the, the Mental Health Services Association. Um, and it's an anatomy of a pandemic. So this particular graph is used for both natural disasters and pandemics. And it gives us generally a roadmap um, of what uh, public emotion might look like through different points in time. Um, and so it's, um, it's uh, basically like several decades of research that have been distilled into this one graphic. Um, so we're gonna start over here by looking at this axis. It shows us emotional highs up here in yellow and emotional lows in blue. And then this, this uh, green line here is time. So this is passage of time. So we're looking at general sort of public sentiment or emotional pieces starting over here. So as a, a disaster approaches, so as we started hearing about COVID and that it was spreading and it was going places, emotions are starting to come down as we're warning and then it's becoming more of a threat and then it actually arrives in the United States. And this impact point will look very different for different people. This might be the first time you heard about it or the first time you knew someone that was diagnosed or when you realized it had reached the United States totally different impact points for each person. But when they went into the impact point, this is a fairly emotional low. 
But as individuals start to realize that this is impacting their daily life, uh, communities start to bond together to, uh, to fight this pandemic, this event in some way. And this is called the heroic phase. So individuals are starting to feel better because they're taking concrete steps to fight this. So they, in your local communities, that might have looked like organizing a food drive, going shopping for elderly neighbors, uh, making or distributing fabric masks or protective equipment. The people are taking concrete steps to do something um, about this problem. And as they are taking those concrete steps, um, they are feeling much better and are heroic. This peaks at the honeymoon phase. So communities are feeling very cohesive. Um, they're working together. You might have met some neighbors you didn't know. People are working together for the greater good and it feels really, really good for everyone. Unfortunately, this does not last that long, um, this phase. All of that hard work for individuals makes a big difference and it's very much appreciated, but it doesn't stop the event from happening. Um, so the pandemic was not magically solved by any of these wonderful things that we all did um, and continue to do for our communities. Those are great and they're really beneficial and at the same time they're not stopping this pandemic. And so as the pandemic continues to unfold, regardless of individual efforts, the emotions that were very, very high fairly quickly moved to very, very low. So individuals tend to lose their sense of hope. Um, and say, there's nothing I can do. We don't know how to stop this. Everything is terrible. And as they, oops, sorry guys. Um, as they lose this sense, we're gonna move down. So at the bottom here, we have these trigger events. Um, and trigger events uh, might be something that helps you temporarily feel better. So you might be able to do something nice for a neighbor, or we see a story on, on the news about someone that was not projected to live, you know, survive the virus that absolutely did. And you see a video of them being released from the hospital. It feels really great for a moment. That might be something as a trigger event. Um, and so those trigger events are happening um, and they get sort of, uh, uh, temporary pops of higher emotions. Um, but then as we move towards the anniversary, it's getting better in about a year. Individuals use that time period to reflect on what it was like when that, that uh, impact happened. So what was it like? Remember last spring when, when we all had to leave Eckerd, it was really terrible. Remember what that was like? At some point, this will be past tense. And we'll say, remember how awful that was? Um, and at that anniversary, people's emotions tend to feel pretty low because they're remembering how scared and out of control they've been. But after that anniversary, we tend to work on reconstruction. So individuals are working through their grief. They're coming to terms with what's happened. They're coming to terms with whatever their new normal looks like. And they're able to return to typical functioning. So as psychologists, we are using this model to project what we are going to need to be able to do in the future. What kind of services are we going to need in six months? What kind are we going to need in a year? What about in five years? So we're using these types of charts and graphs and projections to understand the, the number of needs that we're going to have and plan to make sure that we're going to be able to cover everybody that's going to need some help. If we think about this for ourselves, we're probably somewhere around here right now. Um, so we still have quite a while to go as a society. It doesn't mean that this graph is exactly what's going to happen. Um, and we're going to spend some time today talking about ways in which we can make meaning out of this experience and maybe not entirely bottom out. Um, but we do know that for a lot of people, um, especially emotionally, there's still some very hard times to come. And we want to make sure that we um, are, are managing them and their needs in a professional and supportive way. So I think the take home message from, from that section of our talk together today is that the psychological effect of this event are going are both immediate right now, but they're also going to be durable. Um, so there's also going to be some long term psychological effects um, from individuals who are really struggling with mental health diagnoses right now, um, who are, have had their entire worldview changed, who no longer feel safe in their daily life. There's going to be some really long term effects from this. And this is especially salient for the experience of children. Um, so adults are, you know, you, we're using our adult cognitive skills. We can reason, we can think through things, we can use resources when we have them. We're using all of our adult skills and we're still struggling. But children who don't have those benefits, they don't have adult cognitive skills, they're not in control of their environments, they're struggling too. Um, so we, um, as, a, as providers, we want to think about the needs of children, um, both right now at whatever age they are, and then also as they grow up. Um, so as they grow up and they're, um, they're encountering repercussions from this pandemic, 
um, or they're starting to understand what happened in a very different way as their, their cognitive abilities progress, we're likely going to see needs for kids that will change based on their developmental level. Um, and again, for Thursday, that was one of the questions that I provided to frame your reading and frame your thinking um, about the ways in which this experience might be different for children and the ways in which uh, they might manifest some effects of this uh, going forward as well. Um, as a long-term effect, we know that the mental health system is not doing well in a lot of ways. You guys you read the article, it's got some very scary statistics in there about how many people are not being helped and low funding and low turnover. And all of those things are absolutely true. And uh, the field of, of clinical psychology, of which I'm proud to count myself a member, I'm a licensed psychologist, I see clients, um, we are addressing those needs in a few really unique ways to this pandemic. Um, and to, to be very clear, I think a lot of the ways in which it's unique depends on the technology that we have now. Um, so we're using technology, especially in some, some really uh, interesting ways. So one of, the, one of the ways in which the field is addressing the needs now and to come is by providing training in mental health first aid. And so mental health first aid is an eight hour training that's provided to community members. Um, and those members are not trained therapists. They're just regular teachers and moms and doctors and lawyers. Um, they're whoever wants to participate. And those individuals uh, are trained to sit with individuals in crisis, to be able to sit with them and hear them out, and also to hook them up with resources in their community. So they are community liaisons between professional mental health providers and, um, and individuals who might need services. So they're a really important uh, member of the community. And we also have over a million people in the United States who are trained in mental health first aid. And those individuals, as this pandemic has picked up steam and mental health um, um, symptoms have increased, those individuals have jumped into service. Um, so those individuals are out in their communities, they are connecting with people in any way they can, and they are ensuring that individuals who need assistance are getting hooked up with resources. So mental health first aid and individuals that are trained in that way have become an invaluable part of getting individuals into treatment. Hotlines have also become really, really important. Um, so hotlines are 24-7 are uh, phone numbers that are staffed by trained professionals as well as volunteers. Um, many of them have a specialized function, so it might be a hotline for individuals uh, experiencing domestic violence or substance abuse or LGBT youth, um, but hotlines are available 24-7 anytime you call. Someone will pick up the phone and provide immediate support. By speaking with you. They also can get you hooked up to local resources to make sure that you're being taken care of. But even if it's 2.30 in the morning, you can call the hotline and someone will pick up. So for individuals who are really struggling in this pandemic and they need immediate support, hotlines are incredibly important. Um, they also have become really important in the current world because they don't require going anywhere because you can stay in your home and you can follow the safety procedures and still get immediate support whenever you need it. So hotlines have also uh, been a really wonderful resource. Um, in order to address some of the problems as far as capacity, um, a lot of interventions have been moved over to group. So if you think about um, a therapist, you know, if, if I'm sitting with a client, it's a 50 minute client hour, I'm sitting there with one person. So my client hour and my expertise and my help is used on that one person. That one person is absolutely important. Um, but if we have several people that all need similar intervention, um, in order to, to increase our capacity to serve, we can turn that one hour into a group intervention. And so a lot of mental health clinicians and um, facilities have turned some of their individual uh, time into group time. So that instead of one person getting assistance, you now have eight people who are getting assistance in the same therapy hour. So group intervention is one way in which uh, the mental health system has quickly expanded capacity. Um, and then the last one that I want to talk about is telehealth. Um, so telehealth is the idea that you can, can provide services, either um, physical or mental health services, um, in some kind of uh, non-in-person format. So you're, instead of sitting in person with a doctor or with a psychologist, you can meet with them via phone or you can meet with them via video chat and they can still provide services for you. Um, telehealth has massively accelerated um, because of the pandemic. So pre-pandemic, um, uh, 
clients were less likely to agree to work with telehealth. They wanted to go sit with someone in a room. Um, regulators and insurance were also a little bit hesitant about telehealth. They were wondering about the quality of services. Um, but because of the pandemic and because in-person uh, mental health services are no longer possible, but people are very, very much in need, um, it has created this situation in which telehealth has, has been adopted at a much faster rate than it has in the past. And it also has the added benefit of allowing a lot of clinicians to jump in to help. Um, so our professional association, the American Psychological Association, very much issued like an all hands on deck. Um, so anybody that could help, we have such a need for individuals um, to get mental health support. If you can help, please help. So a lot of uh, retired providers have come out of retirement and have started seeing clients. Um, a lot of clinicians, uh, including myself, are seeing people that we don't typically see. So instead of kids and teenagers, I still see them, but I have several adults now on my caseload, which is not a popular I typically see. Um, but if I can pitch in a little bit and so can everybody else, then we're going to be able to um, address the needs of a very, very large group of people um, with a, a fairly small time investment from a lot. Um, and that really has only been possible because of telehealth. Um, it, it, I wouldn't be able to see anyone staying safely quarantined in my home and they wouldn't be able to get help. But because of the adoption of telehealth, um, as a provider, I'm really excited about the possibilities of where this can go. Um, even, if it, even after the pandemic, if individuals want to go back to you know, seeing someone in person, that's fine, but this also has created the, the infrastructure where now we can see people who live in a rural area and don't have a provider within driving distance, or individuals who have mobility issues and can't leave their home to go to an appointment, or individuals who are immunocompromised and they don't wanna go sit in a waiting room and potentially get sick from other people. So the advancement of telehealth has really allowed us to plug some of the, plug some of the holes in the mental health system and provide more information for people and help for people. Then the last piece that I really wanted to talk to you guys about today is the idea of post-traumatic growth. Um, I included this quote, it's from Peter Levine, he's a, um, he's a really prominent trauma researcher. Um, but it says, trauma is a fact of life, but it does not, however, have to be a life sentence. And I hope that we'll all keep this in mind as we go through the pandemic. Is this something traumatic that's happening? Absolutely. It's really a stressful time to be a human being as we started. However, this feeling and this experience does not have to be a life sentence. We know a lot from the trauma research and positive psychology literature about steps that we can take as individuals to help ourselves learn and grow from situations rather than be paralyzed by them. And so I wanna spend the last bit of our time together today before we move into questions, talking about those pieces, about how can we encourage ourselves um, to, to gain something positive out of this mostly negative experience. So to start thinking about that, I want you to do an activity with me very quickly. So what I want you to think about is to identify three of your greatest moments of growth. You can write them down, you can just think about them, but I want you to take a bit of time and think about three of your greatest moments of growth in your life. So three of your greatest moments of growth. You don't have to write complete sentences. No one is checking in. It's just for your own reference. I'm seeing some people still writing and a few that are done. So I'm going to give you about another 10 seconds to think about those. Okay. So to frame our thoughts about post-traumatic growth, I'd like you to look at your list. Think about those events and think about how many of them are related to a highly stressful period of change. So think about with those events, what was happening right before this moment of growth? And for most people, the answer to that is something that felt really, really awful. It felt really bad at the time. I felt weak, I felt incompetent, I felt like nothing was gonna go right, I felt like I was gonna fail at this. Typically, what happens right before one of those great moments of growth is a time of adversity. And we are currently, all of us, living in this time of adversity. And so this creates for us an unparalleled opportunity to take deliberate steps towards creating that growth, 
the growth moments that are important that move us forward, that define us as people, we have, we have a really unusual opportunity to, to influence that process at the moment. Post-traumatic growth is the general uh, word for, for that growth. It's positive psychological change in the wake of struggling with highly challenging life circumstances. If there was ever a highly challenging life circumstance, we're living in it. This is a wonderful opportunity for us to make positive psychological change. We don't choose trauma. We wouldn't want to choose trauma. I don't think anyone would voluntarily want to do what we're doing right now. But when it happens, we are in charge of what we want to do with that experience. So trauma is something happens to us, but we're in charge of what happens after that. And we know from the, the trauma literature and positive psychology and clinical literatures that there are definitely some steps that we can take that encourage post-traumatic growth and encourage us to move forward from this with some better understanding of ourselves, of our world, and a more deliberate way to live. So we're going to spend our last bit of time here together before we move into the Q&A talking about how we foster growth in this COVID-19 experience. So first, a suggestion from the trauma literature to organize your experience, to set aside some time to think about your experience and organize it in some way. You can write about it, which is what we would typically do in therapy. You can write a narrative about it or a journal. You could write a fictionalized version of it, but in some way to organize your thoughts about this. You could create art, visual art, music, dance, whatever speaks to you, create a scrapbook, make a file, maybe there's newspaper clippings or papers or you know, any sort of, sort of physical documents that you wanna keep, you can put them in a file, but in some way deliberately set aside time to think about your experience and organize it for yourself. You also want to try to exercise control. So in this situation, we often are not controlling what's happening. We would like to be able to go and sit inside a Starbucks, but we're no longer permitted to do that, for example. I wanna go, you know, go into Walmart, but I have to wait in line. You know, I wanna to go to the bookstore, but the bookstore is closed. Um, we can have all of these things that are outside of our control. And so in order to foster growth, we want to do the opposite of that as much as we can. We wanna remind ourselves that we do indeed have control over many aspects of our, of our experience. Obviously the ones that we don't are anxiety provoking, but we do actually have a lot of control. And so we wanna exercise that control with deliberate and concrete actions. So anything that you've decided, this is my option, I can do this, do it. Decide what you want to eat, decide what you want to wear, who you want to spend your time with, how you want to spend your time in your day. There are a lot of opportunities within your day and your experience to exercise control and remind yourself that you are indeed actually in charge of a lot of your experience. A third uh, sort of recommendation, this is more from the clinical literature, is to ask yourself, what have you learned from this experience? And this is a question you can ask as an ongoing conversation or dialogue with yourself or this is something you can ask maybe in a few months when we're, um, you know, sort of made some progress in this pandemic and, and some time has passed. But asking yourself what you have learned out of this experience, again, helps you to make meaning out of this experience. So it might be that you learned, even though you don't want to do something, you can actually bear it. Right? It might be that you learned that you um, have a talent for connecting with other people whatever it is. And this is probably something that you wanna to continue to ask yourself as we move forward through this experience together. But by asking yourself what you have learned, you're helping yourself to make meaning and see the bigger picture of this experience rather than the minutia of the negative feelings that we have during it. I would also encourage you to use your social support. Um, lots and lots of research tells us that connecting with other people is one of the best ways to ward off loneliness and anxiety and depression and all of these experiences people are having that feel really terrible. Use your social support. Even if you can't go and hug your best friend, you can have virtual happy hour. There are things that you can do. Um, so use your social support, whatever that looks like, use your social support. It will help you come through this um, in a better position than you would otherwise. I would also invite you to embrace new opportunities. The pandemic itself is a new opportunity. It's not one we would have chosen, but it's a new experience. But by embracing opportunities that are new, it allows you to grow and change from this experience. We don't get to change if we don't try anything new. If we keep doing the same thing, we're always the same person, right? But if we embrace new opportunities, we're growing, we're changing, we're stretching our thinking, we're stretching our feeling. So even in situations that are uncontrollable and a little scary, like the pandemic, you have the option to embrace opportunities that you'd like to do. 
uh, if we're following on some of the social media, baking bread has become the new activity of the pandemic. <laughs> so new opportunities like that, uh, learning a new skill or a hobby, getting to know someone different, uh, you know, connecting with your friends in a different way. If you have opportunities to try something new, try them. It helps your brain distract for a while to learn something new and get excited about something. So it gives you a break from the, the negativity or the, uh, the, the sort of oppression of, of a lot of people's experience of the pandemic. I would also invite you to consider very deliberately what actions and or values you'd like to keep from your experience in the pandemic. It's very likely that you are trying some new activities that you might be enacting your values in a different way during the pandemic than you typically do. So you may have started volunteering with a local organization. You may suddenly be friendly with neighbors that you have lived there two years and have never talked to them. There might be things that you are doing differently or ways in which you're enacting your values that are very different than during the pandemic than in your typical life. And those are very easy to drop once the pandemic is over or once we return to something a semblance of normalcy whatever that's going to look like so i would encourage you to consider do i want to keep any of those things do i want to keep you know driving for the meal volunteer do i want to continue to connect with my neighbors whatever it is that you're doing do you want to keep that thing instead of allowing it to pass or drop without thinking I would also encourage you to start a gratitude practice. This is another one from the positive psychology and clinical literatures that we know helps a lot. Um, so a gratitude practice can look like anything as long as you are, are, are identifying some things that you're grateful for. Um, so some individuals do this as a journal in the morning, they might start a gratitude journal or sort of do it as a, a process where they're brushing their teeth, maybe a lot of people. Um, just spend some time during your day thinking about things that are grateful. If you uh, have children or you're a part of a larger family, you might do a gratitude practice as a family event. Um, so some families, uh, they start dinner as a gratitude practice. So everyone goes around and says something that they're grateful for or as part of the bedtime routine. Um, but whatever you want that to look like, starting a gratitude practice can train your brain to look at positive pieces of situations and focus on what you can do and what feels good rather than focusing on the negative or things that are unchangeable. And because I'm a child and adolescent psychologist, I have to throw in some things to do for little ones. Um, a lot of you guys have children at home, um, or you might have children in your family that you love very much. And here are some things that you can do to help kiddos um, with post-traumatic growth, because this works for young people of any ages as well. Um, for kiddos, in order to help them um, come through this experience in a stronger position, the first thing you wanna do is emphasize safety measures for them. Um, so as adults, we can decide what safety measures we want to take. We can evaluate our own data, decide what we want to do. Kids don't have those options. Um, so they are in an even, uh, they have even less control than you do. So think about that for a bit about what it would be like to be in an even less powerful position than most of us feel right now. Um, and so for kids, it's important to emphasize the safety measures that you are taking. So they are not responsible for their own safety. Adults are. And so adults can emphasize what we're doing to keep them safe. So the reason that you can't go to grandma's house is because we want to make sure that both you and grandma are safe. So we're going to talk to her on the computer instead of going to visit her. Or, you know, we're going to wash our hands a lot. Or we're going to wear a mask when we go outside to make sure that we're trying to keep everybody safe. So we're emphasizing the safety measures that you are taking. So kids get the message that this can be a safe world, that adults are protecting them um, to the best of our ability, and that they, they can trust adults to take care of them. The second recommendation is to be very truthful with kids about it. Um, kids get very confused if they can tell something's wrong, but all the adults keep saying, no, 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 everything's fine. It's very confusing. They can tell something's wrong. They can hear your tone of voice. They're watching your facial expression. They might be you know, catching the tail end of conversations or TV programs. They can tell something's wrong. Um, so if we deny that to them and say, no, 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 everything's fine, they're learning not to trust themselves about issues. So we wanna make sure that we're explaining things to them very truthfully, but at an age appropriate level. Um, so, you know, if you have a small child who's worried about what's happening in the pandemic, you can say something like, yes, you know, lots of people are very sick, they're at the hospitals, and the doctors or nurses are trying to help them feel better. That's all they need, but they need something. Yes, something's happening. And you can combine this with the idea of safety measures and explain what's happening, and then this is what we're doing to keep you and your brother safe. This is what we're doing at our house. So it allows the kids to understand why we're doing those things. And then finally with kids, 
you also want to give them choices when you can. So just like as an adult, you want to exercise your control, give kids a chance to exercise their control as well. Um, so it might be something small. Do you want oatmeal or cereal for breakfast? Do you want to wear your red shirt or your blue shirt? Do you want to start with your English homework or your violin lesson? Like whatever it is, but give them some choices too. Um, everybody likes choices. And especially in uh, a time like the current pandemic, when it often feels like we don't have a lot of choices, any autonomy for people of any ages um, is entirely welcome. So um, I am really excited that I got to share some of this with you all. Um, I am excited to move into the Q&A and hear some of your, your thoughts and comments. Um, I believe Professor Vincent's gonna moderate that. So I'm gonna turn this back over to her.